Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third Palaver series uh, here at the Bunch Center. My name is Wheeler Winstead, and I am the Assistant Director for the Center for African Studies. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Center, and I would imagine a few of you may not be since it is a brand new Center, uh, the Center is a Title VI program um, that was developed by the U.S. Department of Education, and it was the purpose of it was to establish national resource centers and foreign language area study programs. Uh, the primary pro purpose of these programs was to strengthen the capacity and performance of students and instructors in African languages and African studies. And as a center, uh, we offer a number of different. Uh, offerings for both the community and the school. Uh, we offer trainings, presentations, uh, and funding to both the college, to uh, colleges outside of our uh, Howard University, to community colleges, to K-12 schools, to houses of worship, and the communities at large. And uh, we also offer money. Uh, and I don't see any of the recipients of our Flask Awards, but we do offer fellowships for students who are interested in furthering their study in African languages and African area studies. Uh, before I say any more, I'd like to introduce Dean Muta, who's also going to give you a brief welcome. Dean? Good afternoon. It is um, a real pleasure uh, for me to, uh, to greet everyone uh, this afternoon. I know most of us are part of the Howard family, but for those of us who may not be welcome uh, to Howard University on behalf of our president, Dr. Wayne Frederick, um, it's an especial pleasure for me uh, to be here uh, because I've had the opportunity to uh, get to know and, and work with um, uh, Mr. Hollis for uh, about two years now. And um, for those of you who may not know him, he's had uh, seven previous lives, uh, including as uh, superintendent of schools in, in Baltimore, has, has run a number of political campaigns, and, and we were having an interesting um, conversation about what is um, taking place recently in, in Baltimore, and um, his context as having served as the superintendent of schools and, and, and really had a, a wealth of um, previous political experience. Um, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to hear what he has to say um, regarding the, the topic at hand, uh, but I don't think there are a few people um, who have um, his background, have his experience, have um, the compassion and energy that he has to, to try to see things improve um, educationally for people of, of color, and so it's, it's a real honor for me to, to be here, and, and I look forward to uh, um, hearing his comments uh, today. So welcome again, and, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. I want to thank all of you again for coming. Uh, the Palaver series actually was started as a part of the African Studies Department, and the idea of the Palaver is to address and talk about hot topics that are affecting the continent today and to bring in subject matter experts who would give a particular uh, opinion and then to have an opportunity for those of us who are here to have some Q&A. And so that's the basic idea of the Palaver series. Um, as I said, this is the first year of the center and this is just our third Palaver series uh, uh, that we have had. And, and I need your help. On your little area right in front of you is a piece of paper. We would like to get some ideas, um, and if you don't have a piece of paper, you can write it on just plain piece of paper. We're interested in finding out what topics you would like to see uh, for next year, because we are already putting together our Palaver series for the coming year. So um, as the discussion goes on, if you have any ideas that you think Howard should have, and particularly the center should have a collaborative series on this particular topic. We would love to have you share that information with us. So if you could please put that on the white sheet of paper in front of you, and then uh, you can give it to Vanessa at the door. 
and uh, she will uh, uh, will then uh, put those in consideration. Um, you also, when you came in, were given some chocolates. And those chocolates were provided for you by one of the partners of the center, uh, Divine Chocolates. Divine Chocolates, fairly interesting progressive company um, that is a fair trade company that is owned by the cocoa farmers in Ghana. And so we, uh, we like to promote them and would encourage you to promote them uh, because this is, as I said, a farmer owned company and by purchasing and eating, uh, well, you don't have to eat them, just buy the chocolates. Uh, we are helping economic development directly in the country of Ghana. So uh, these are our little brochures. If you want to know more about Divine Chocolates, take one of these little brochures um, and uh, you'll know more. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Dr. Hailu, who is going to introduce our guest. Um, and for those of you who may not have gotten the notice, our topic today is HBCUs in the future of African development. And that's going to be um, our topic. Uh, the way we're going to proceed is that our guest, uh, Mr. Hollis, will make a presentation uh, approximately up until about 2.30. And afterwards, we're going to have Q&A from, uh, from you, and then we'll close out. Um, before I do that, I would like to recognize several uh, dignitaries in our presence. Uh, we do have, um, I believe, someone from the Senegal uh, Embassy. And I'm sorry, I wrote the, your name over there. If you could just give us your name. I'm a consular minister in charge of the Economic Bureau. Thank you for coming. Um, I also know we have someone who we might consider a dignitary who was former head of police, uh, uh, campus police here, Mr. James over there. So we know we're safe uh, with Mr. James in our, in our presence. Uh, I don't know if there's any other persons representing embassies here that we need to introduce. They're not. Okay, uh, and uh, in, in terms of our own dignitaries, often we don't give credit to some of the people here at Howard who make these things possible. Um, and I, I just, if you don't know, one of the, probably the, the primary architect of the whole idea uh, of the center and its grant was uh, Dr. Cham. And we appreciate your work here, Dr. Cham, who is also uh, the chair of our department. And we also have the director of the center, uh, Dr. Edgar there. And he is the director of the center, and we have one another of our professors here, uh, Dr. Zodi, uh, also a professor here uh, at African Studies. So I just wanted to know, wanted you to know, you are sitting in the presence of uh, uh, dignitaries. Myers, Josh Myers from African Studies. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Chan. Um, before I let Dr. Hilo introduce our speaker. I would like to uh, have us take a moment of silence um, for your own personal prayer, reflection, however you want to put it, for um, the suffering people in Nepal, for peace and justice in Baltimore, uh, and for our many brothers and sisters in the continent who uh, are struggling day to day. Uh, I just think it is important that on a regular basis that we take time to remember them, but not only to remember them, but we can ask ourselves, what is it that we could do in order to uh, alleviate that suffering? So if we could just take a, a few minutes uh, for that. I mean, thank you very much. Now, Dr. Hailu, he'll be introducing our guest speaker and moderating the Q&A. I also join Dean Wooten in uh, expressing my sense of joy and honor introducing our, our 
honored guest here. But the problem is, as he pointed out, how do you introduce a person who had seven lives to take at least seven hours to go over his achievements and his work? So in the interest of time, I'll just mention some of the highlights of his, of his life and uh, let him speak on an important topic we all are looking forward to. He is partly coming here to Howard, in which he was a valued member of the teaching and administrative family. As a prominent public official, he has led in various governmental positions and national initiatives. In his capacity as a coordinator for intergovernmental affairs in the external affairs division and program officer for policy and procedures branch of the public assistance division, Mr. Hallis played leading roles in the Federal Emergency Management Agency known as FEMA. A long record of outstanding life achievement of 35 years in public service spans wide range of stellar performance from his service as an enlisted man in the Army to his presidential nomination to the West Point Military Academy and special assistantship to the Secretary for Education. His academic achievements and work starts with his education with an MA in, governmental, in Government and Politics from the University of Maryland at College Park, Maryland, JD and MPA from Harvard University, which extended to his study of international law and indigenous courts at the University of Legion, Ghana, in West Africa, as we all know. In university settings, he has taught on the faculties of Northeast University College Park at, at Baltimore County campuses of the University of Maryland and here at Howard University. So without much ado, I'd like to say that again, I'm delighted to introduce him and look forward to his sharing with us on a subject which is near and dear to our heart, HBCUs and its connections to Africa, to African development. Thank you. I want to uh, thank you all for having me as your guest uh, today. I have been looking forward uh, to an opportunity to uh, sit with former colleagues and uh, new colleagues and to discuss something that's very dear to my heart, which is the relationship of Africans in the diaspora uh, to the continent and a potential role that they might play uh, as the continent seeks to move forward uh, towards its own political objectives. Um, I will talk about um, HBCUs because that is what my job is and I'm supposed to know something about them. Um, and I will talk a little, I will talk about Africa and what I think are some opportunities for the two interests uh, to come together. Uh, Dr. Wuto was talking about one of the many lives that I have led in the past as we were coming in. He asked me what I thought about what was going on in Baltimore. And for me, it's, uh, it's a little strange to watch Stephanie Rawlings, um, who is now the mayor of Baltimore, taking on such heavy responsibilities. Because for me, Stephanie was a little girl I used to bounce on my knee. Her father, Howard Pete Rawlings, was my best friend for many, many years. And as I would visit the house, there was Stephanie and her brother, and Pete thought that her brother would end up being the politician in the family. But uh, as it has worked out, uh, Stephanie um, is now running the city. And at first, I thought that her response was a little weak and untimely. And then last night, I thought about it, and I asked myself, what is the most important number? That people talked about the number of um, arrests, um, and uh, the number of buildings that burned down, and then it occurred to me that the most important number was the number zero. Not one person has died as a result of her response. And in the end, I have to think that her response was the correct response. The idea is to keep our young people alive. Uh, and I think their lives are more important than the buildings. And so whatever else we may have thought, um, whether the troops got there late or the troops got there early. I know those places. I used to be president of the school board. Um, the most difficult decision is when to keep the schools open and when to close them. Um, but in the end, the number is zero. Not one of our children has died. And so for that reason, whatever else the process has been, I think that her handling of this matter to this point 
needs the support of the people around her. Um, your chief of police uh, is sitting in this meeting uh, in our office. Um, I work in three particular areas. One of them is with STEM programs, um, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics programs. The other is in emergency management and homeland security. And with that organization, with that in that area, I work with the HBCU Law Enforcement Executives Association and your chief and I uh, thereby have some relationships. It's, uh, it's an important relationship. Many people don't understand how important it is uh, to make sure that these campuses are safe, but if as a federal official, uh, I am supporting institutions of higher education, particularly historically black colleges and universities, I think I have the concomitant um, responsibility to make sure those institutions are as safe as any other institution. Otherwise, how could I make recommendations? Uh, to attend those institutions. So it's good to see the chief here. The White House Initiative for Historically Black Colleges and Universities was created on August 8th, 1980 in the lawn at the White House. Um, and I have a picture of Jimmy Carter signing that document. And the reason I know about that was because I was in the garden when he signed it. My boss at that time was a Mary Frances Berry, who was a graduate of this institution. And when Jimmy Carter decided to run for president for a second term, Mary Frances Berry was assistant secretary for education. The question in this town was whether or not she would become the first secretary of education as he created the department. He had decided to run for president and he had no white women in his cabinet and only one vacancy and that was secretary of education. So given the way this town works, the decision was made notwithstanding qualifications or anything else that had to do with the running for president of the United States. I remember when she came back, uh, we were informed that the president was going to pick the qualifications for being secretary of education. And I had uh, to be careful by saying, that, saying this is a, at, a, at a live mic, but you had to be of a certain persuasion and you had to be from the state of California because there was a guy named Reagan who was going to run against him. And you do not remember the name of the first secretary of education. Um, but politics is politics. When it was clear that Dr. Barry, who at then, then was the highest individual in the country in education, was going to leave that department, the leadership of HBCUs panicked for the first time in history. The leaders of these institutions had first-hand access to the most powerful public official and had the national education in the country. And that was Dr. Barry, who happened to be a graduate of Howard. You didn't have to explain HBCUs to Dr. Uh, Barry. And I was her special assistant. And when these issues would come up, I would sit in the corner. She would make a decision and say, Mel, you take care of it. Uh, and when it was clear that she was not going to become the secretary, um, there was a gathering, a gathering of all the Grease eminence, all of the, the big, powerful people, uh, Jesse Jackson, Vernon Jordan, all of the all of the big timers got together um, and said, "We've got to get Doc. We've got to get Jimmy Carter to do something about this." And so they asked uh, Dr. King's father to call the White House and set up a meeting. And Dr. King's father, Daddy King, called and reminded Jimmy Carter that while he was governor of Georgia, he'd been given an honorary degree at Morehouse, and that his son had graduated from Morehouse. And Jimmy Carter understood what role these institutions played. He had to. Andy Young, who was a graduate of Xavier, was his ambassador to the UN. Pat Harris, who was a graduate of Howard, was his secretary of HUD. And he had grown up in the South, so he understood what roles these institutions play, particularly in creating national and international leadership. And he was sympathetic to the idea and said, okay, I'll have an office report directly to me. And so you have an office named the White House Initiative for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And in that day, the first executive director reported directly to the uh, special assistant, to the president. There was only one person between me and the president of the United States. Uh, those days have changed. Uh, different. There have been six presidents who have, who have um, each signed an executive order. 
And remember, this office is created by executive order, which means by its terms, when that president leaves, then the authority of that office leaves. It has to be reinstituted. Um, president Obama is the sixth president to sign an executive order. Both of the Bushes signed an executive order. Reagan signed an executive order. That is an interesting story. I wish I had time to tell you how I convinced President Reagan to sign an executive order. He grew up in Iowa and lived in California. He had no idea what an HBCU was. But a former swimming coach from Howard, who happened to be named Pendleton, uh, who was out in California, and a member of the Urban League, we came up with a very interesting strategy, maybe in the question and answer period, I can tell you why Mr. Reagan signed uh, a White House initiative for historical black colleges and universities. I want to try to do a couple of things. The first uh, is let's start with the fact that you must know that this is the international decade for people of African descent. Of course you know that. You know that the UN declared that on the 1st of January and has set out a number of activities uh, which um, it was proclaimed on 23rd of December 2013 uh, International Decade for People of African def uh, Descent commencing 1 January 2014 and ending 31 December 2024 uh, to bring to people of African descent uh, rec uh, recognition justice and development and so within that framework there's an international framework which is to bring attention to the activities and the struggles of people of African descent so we will start there the second thing that I would do is I would just make note of some things that have been on the president's schedule uh, oh let me just step back and say to you that we are going to talk about Africa but to talk about Africa as as though it is isolated by itself I think would do a disservice to what we're going to talk about I'm just going to point something out to you very quickly because we're going to discuss them but first uh, the rising share of US black population is foreign born uh, and that is about nine percent at this point historically that has been largely Jamaicans and folks from the uh, uh, from the uh, Caribbean, but the interesting pattern that is noted here now is that much of that expansion now is people of African descent from Sub-Saharan Africa. Now we'll talk about what that impact is, and it's having a very interesting impact. I'll just go to it right now. Um, within that group, well, I know I'll wait. I'll wait and, and get to it in a minute. Um, this particular study looks at Africans uh, from both the Car well, from the diaspora. It looks at the movement from Central America, from South America, and Africa, and its impact on the black population in the United States. Very interesting conclusions if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it. This study by the census is called the Foreign Born Population from Africa 2008-2012. Uh, there's a difference in definition between the way the census department goes about this and the way uh, Pew, uh, the Pew uh, Research Center goes about it. Evidently, the Pew Research Center does not know that Egypt is part of Africa, so Egyptians are left out of the Pew Center. Uh, within, the, uh, uh, within the Census Department, however, uh, they have concluded that Egypt is part of Africa, and therefore Egyptians are the third largest group that you will find analyzed within the study. But for you, I think you will find it very interesting reading, and I will speak to them, um, uh, some of their conclusions in a moment. We, I, I want to talk about the diaspora. Here is something that goes on within the federal government. You may not know, but the federal government studies HBCUs, uh, and we're interested in what, con what contribution HBCUs might make to national interest. This is a study which I asked the Department of Homeland Security to put together. International Student Overview for Historical Black Colleges and Universities. We then did a seminar and invited representatives of HBCUs to participate in that study. Uh, and so one of the pages out of that study is called HBCUs by the Numbers, and I think you'll be interested in the conclusions that the Department of Homeland Security reaches when it takes a look at the role of historical black colleges and universities play. And finally, 
I will be referring to uh, studies by the International Institute for Inter the Institute for International Education, which does a tracking of student programs um, uh, across the world, and where uh, HBCUs in Africa and people of African descent uh, fall into that category. Let me first go to the idea that um, well, let let me let me. Uh, uh, let me tell you how we get to the federal interest in what you are doing or not doing in the area of international education. In 2013, a small article in the Washington Post made note of the fact that the majority of the babies born in the United States in that year were not white. That's in 2013. In 2014, another small article in the Washington Post made note of the fact that for the first time in the history of this country, the majority of youngsters in the public school systems of the United States were not white. The Census Department tells us that by the year 2018, the majority of people in this country under the age of 18 will not be white. Now, I rate, well, people like to concentrate on the year 2040, because in that year, the population is to shift so that this becomes a majority minority country in 2040. But why do you care about 2040? If you are an institution of higher education, you are not recruiting 65 year olds. You're recruiting 14, 15, 16 year olds. I just told you, by 2018, the majority of Americans in this country will no longer be of what is now the majority race. I want to let that sink in for a minute because colleges and universities recruit from that population. And so, if you are going to exist going forward, the question is, what is your posture? Do you have any market advantage? How do you survive uh, in that environment? You're gonna have to go to where the students are. Add to that the fact that every analyst that I know predicts a contraction of that industry that you now call higher education because the digitization of the world means freer access to more people with less costs. I can now, from here, teach 30 or 40 people in other countries from my living room at a much lower cost than it would cost for them to come and sit at a brick and mortar location. And that in and of itself has implications, not just for HBCUs, but for all institutions of higher education. And the title of an economist two or three weeks ago was, The World Goes to University. More and more information will, fly, will flow more freely, and it will be a much more competitive environment, just not, not just for HBCUs, but for everyone. Um, you may have not noticed, but in California, uh, the largest ethnic group is Hispanic or Latino, Spanish speaking. And in Texas, when you combine Latino and African Americans, you have about 56, 57 percent of the population. That's a majority. And in New Mexico and Hawaii, also, you have minority majorities. Uh, Nevada and Georgia will follow soon. The reason I mentioned California and Texas is because California, Texas, Florida, and New York have the largest group of electoral votes and electoral college, and the easy way to get to 270 is to start with the largest states, okay? And in each of the two largest states, of course, African Americans are outnumbered by Latinos, and that ought to tell you why people don't, will not need you to, inform, to set forth their political agenda, as we would have thought when I was a young man. Uh, that's important for you to know. Um, I want to now go to Africans in the diaspora just for a minute because this is something I'd like for you to think about. When we look at, in that census report, um, the countries of origin of people of African descent in the United States, I'm just going to rank them. I'm not going to give you the numbers of thousands, the information is in the report. But number one is Nigeria. Number two is Ethiopia. Number three is Egypt. Number four is Ghana. Number five is Kenya. And then South Africa. I then move to the states where those folks are concentrated. 
And the largest number is in New York, then California, then Texas, then Maryland, then New Jersey, and Virginia. Um, Maryland and Virginia ought to jump out at you because these other states are huge states. And so uh, the populations are larger for every category in those states. But Maryland and Virginia are smaller and compacter, but yet they have large numbers of uh, people of African descent. And if you take Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia together, you've got the largest clumping of people of African descent anywhere in the United States that has, I think, all kinds of implications. It has implications for a number of reasons. And then when I look at the cities where, these con where this congregation is taking place, uh, New York, New Jersey is number one. I'm talking about urban areas. Los Angeles, Long Beach is two. Chicago is three. But this is the, basically the size of the cities. Then you have Houston. Then you have San Francisco. Then you have the Washington, D.C., uh, Arlington area. One of, the, one of the notes I will make is that 41% of folks of African descent bring with them bachelor's degrees or higher. Uh, that works out to be 61% of Nigerians who have immigrated to this country and 64% of the Egyptians. While I'm on that point, I want to make clear that between 2000, between 2000, between uh, 1980 in the year 2000, more Africans came to this country voluntarily than were brought here in ships as slaves. That has repeated itself again between 2000 and 2010, just if you want to get. Uh, that's a number that sets people back. Uh, but uh, that is that's something that we need to deal with. Um, a rising share of U.S. black population is foreign-born, 9% are immigrants, while most are from the Caribbean. Africans are driving the recent growth. That's the, Pew Re that's the result of the Pew Research report. Um, the countries of origin looking at the diaspora, the largest number in this country now is Jamaica, come from Jamaica, then Haiti, then after that Nigeria, Trinidad, and Tobago, Ethiopia, Dominican Republic, Ghana, Guyana, Kenya, and Liberia. I go through those countries because I want you to get the sense that the movement of Africans into this country are not just from, not just from West Coast of Africa, but you've also got Kenya in there, you've got Ethiopia in there, you've got Egypt in there. Uh, then you've got the Dominican Republic, and you've got Guyana and, uh, and uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I, I can remember hearing conversations on college campuses as African-American students confronted kid youngsters from the Dominican Republic, insisting that those students make a choice. Either they were going to be Latino or they were going to be black, but they couldn't be both, which of course is very confusing to people who've been both black and Latino all their lives. Uh, I've also heard Puerto Ricans confronted in this way, uh, being told that you, you're just going to have to make a choice. That's because that's the American way of doing things. I've also heard my friends uh, instruct my African friends that you cannot listen to classical music because that is not black. Uh, we have a certain kind of music that we listen to. Would you cut that stuff off? Uh, there are some interesting conversations that take place that we may want to take up a little later. Again, I want to take a look at the influx of African immigrants into the country. They are, in general, older than the African-American population. The average number of an immigrant from Africa to this country is age 42. The average age of an African-American who was born here is 29. The, if you look at college degrees from all of those in Africa who've come into the country, 26% of them have college degrees. They, are, they move into a population where only 19% of the population of African Americans have degrees. Their household income is more than $10,000 higher than the African Americans here in the country, which raises very different, very some very interesting issues which we may talk about. The other issue is 48% of them are married and have what we call complete families. Compare that to 28% of the African American population, and that raises very interesting issues in terms of dialogue uh, and in terms of cultural perspective. Now, uh, having muddle the water a little. We are going to get to Africa. Uh, but one of the things that I'd like to talk to you about is the world that I grew up in and the world that our children will inherit. The world that our children will inherit 
I don't recognize and they would not recognize my world. Um, let me just make note of this in terms of who the powerful countries are in the world. The largest population in the world is China followed by India. If you just put China and India together, you have 40% of the world's population. The United States makes up 5% of the world's population. Most Americans think we must be 30 or 40%, at least we make up 5%. And at the national security level, the issue is how does this 5% get along with the other 95% of the world's population? It calls for perspective you would not have if you watch CNN every day or Fox News, you would think this is the world and the rest of the world has got to catch up. That's right. um, let me go on down the list. The United States is third and the United States is only 5% of the world followed by how many people know what number four is? Just to, just to show you what America does to you. Everybody can get you down to America. What's next? Just like I thought. Nigeria. Indonesia. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. It is in Asia, and the people are Muslim, of Muslim religion, which throws a whole bunch of people off. Why do you get a Muslim country in, in Southeast Asia? But it is there. Okay, and with a growing, it is a growing democracy. It's already had a female president, something that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, let me say again, it is in Asia, and it has a Muslim population but it's already had a female president. After Indonesia comes Brazil, then Pakistan, then Nigeria and Bangladesh. Interestingly enough, if you put Pakistan and Bangladesh back into India, where it started out in the first place, you would have a huge country, uh, by far the largest in the world. Uh, going forward, India will have the largest Muslim population in the world. Uh, even though they will be smaller than the Hindu population, and then Russia, Japan, and Mexico. I make that point because when you look at where the world's population is, you did not hear me mention one country in Europe. Let me make that point again. You did not hear me mention one country in Europe. Okay, now, maybe what we ought to do is concentrate on the size of the economies in the world. That should tell us where the world is going and where we ought to move to assert our interest. If I take a look at the size of the, of the world's economies, the United States is largest, depending on how you measure the economy, because there are those who will tell you that China has already caught up with the United States. It depends on how you, how you measure the economy. But China is number two, Japan is number three, India is number four, Germany is four, Russia five, Brazil six, the UK is seven, France, Italy, and Mexico. When I came up as a young man, you started with the United States, then you went to the UK, and then France and Italy, da 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 da. They are sliding down. Those economies are held stagnant. The rest of the world is expanding at a much quicker rate. As a matter of fact, the, ten, the world's 10 fastest growing economies between 2001 and 2010 were Angola, number one, China, number two, Myanmar, three, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kazakhstan, Chad, Mozambique. Cambodia, and Rwanda. Please note that six out of those 10 are in Africa. Mm -hmm. If I look at the projections going forward from 2011 to 2015, China is one, India is two, Ethiopia is three, Mozambique, then Tanzania, Vietnam, Congo, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria. Again, going forward, the fastest spending economies are in on the mother candidate, the mother continent. That in and of itself ought to provide significant opportunities for those who are thinking either about power shifts in the world, the politics of the world, or who are thinking about economic growth. If this country intends to maintain its position in the world, its power in the world, it needs not because it's a good thing to do, but in its own self-interest. It must be able to reach out to where the economic growth is, where the population is, and where the power is growing and is going to be. There are some trends you cannot stop. The demographic trends I told you about populations, you, 
you cannot stop them. You may not believe in temperature change or climate change, but just wait. You may not believe that women are becoming more empowered in this world, but just wait. Now, there are certain very important trends, and in, in, uh, the, the change is being brought on by the digital change in the world, everything being connected by, um, by the internet is a wave that cannot be stopped. So rather than try to fight it, you need to figure out what you can do to take advantage of it. Um, but getting back to our own interests, I want to just talk to you for a minute, and I know you're getting ready for me to, to sit down. Uh, let me talk about our international students and what we do in terms of student programs uh, in this country. Thank you again, Thank Mr. You. I will be mentioning Senegal before I get to the oh. end of this because you did a very good presentation for us the other day. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at where you, international students who come to the United States come from. First of all, you should know that we have about 900,000 international students in this country. Uh, about 275,000 come from China, 100,000 come from India, 68,000 come from South Korea. I give you those numbers, 274,000, because that number is about equal to the number of students who attend HBCUs in this country. Okay, so China has as many students in this country, almost. Uh, as there are students in HBCUs in the 105 institutions, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, as I said, I asked, um, I asked the Department of Homeland Security to take a look so we could see what was going on with uh, students and uh, international students at HBCUs. I will tell you the number is a little over 8,000 for all 100 institutions. Um, I would ask you to guess what is the number one producer of international students for HBCUs and for at least a decade it has been Nigeria and which is what I expected when I got the numbers but uh, the, uh, Saudi Arabia has almost twice the number of students on HBCU campuses as Nigeria but Nigeria is number two India as number three the Bahamas as number four and Jamaica is number five. Uh, the primary education level of those students, they're working on their bachelor's degrees. The top five majors for these students are in our business and administration. That's one. Computer science is two. Biological science is three. Engineering and accounting uh, round out their choices. Now, having said that, I want to go back to take a look at what's going on with the rest of the world. I gave you the numbers for those coming in. They come from China, India, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Taiwan, Vietnam. That's, the, that's what's coming into the United States with Brazil being number two. Now, where do we send students? Let just a, a moment, uh, just a, a minute about what those students look like. Uh, about 65% female. Um, 4%, 24% minority, about 4% of them are a of African American descent. But where do they go in the numbers? The largest number of American students who study abroad go to the United Kingdom. The second largest go to Italy, then Spain, then France, then China, then Germany, then Costa Rica. Please note that they have nothing to do with the countries that I mentioned to you as having the world's largest population with the exception of China or having the world's largest uh, economy. So the question to me is, why is that where we are sending our students? Uh, where I tell people that for those of you who are very progressive and have figured out that there's a lot of growth going on in Southeast Asia and that you need to get down to Vietnam and Malaysia uh, and uh, Indonesia, so you can get ahead of the curve, you will probably find out that they are not there when you get there because they are in Africa, okay, where they know the economy is growing and where the real issues of the world are going to be shaped because it is the last continent. If one is looking for agricultural resources and fisheries, I'm not just talking about, I'm just not talking about commodities, but the fight, the final fight is going to come over the resources in and around. 
Africa. And if you go to Asia now, you'll find out that the Asian businessmen have figured that out, and they're very busy trying to cut deals uh, in Africa. And when you get there, you're going to have to compete, uh, not simply present yourself. Now, a word about HBCUs because um, we're getting to the point where you're going to start falling asleep. Um, there are about a hundred HBCUs. Um, half, uh, and looking at 90, about 40 of them are public, about 40 of them are private, and 11 of them are two-year institutions. Right out of the box, you should know that eight of those institutions, uh, on at least eight of those campuses, African Americans are in the minority. Uh, St. Phillips in, uh, in Texas, it's Latino. Of course, West Virginia State and Bluefield State, it's, uh, it's white, but there, there are at least seven campuses I can think of where African Americans are not in the majority. The term historically black college and university means what it says historically. It does not guarantee that you will always be an African American institution. There are also institutions called predominantly black institutions. The legal difference is that as of 1964, up until 1964, institutions were set up specifically for the education of African Americans. It was legal, you could do that. Can't do that after 1964, but the demographic trends don't affect just African American institutions. There are institutions that used to be predominantly white that are now predominantly black. The number one awardees of, of bachelor's degrees over the last two years has been Georgia State. It bumped Howard as number one, and Howard and North Carolina A&T fought over that um, over that role for two or three years, but uh, Georgia State crows now that they award more bachelors to African Americans than either of the two historically black institutions. Even so, um, even though these institutions make up only 2.5% of the higher education institutions and educate about 300,000 students, um, they produce 20% of the engineering students who are of African descent in this country, and 33% of those with degrees in mathematics, and 21% of those with degrees in psychology, 35% of those with degrees in physical sciences, 33% of those with degrees in biological sciences, 25% of those with degrees in computer sciences, and 45% of those with degrees in agricultural sciences. That's punching well above your weight. And anyone who understands the importance of diversification in the workforce going forward has to acknowledge that this is a valuable resource that has to be supported. Uh, they are. Now, I'm not going to say that every African-American institution performs at that level. I'm going to tell you about a couple of conversations I've had with those who are interested in these institutions. I had it. Um, uh, talk about a, uh, an experience I had uh, in Alabama uh, with uh, the special advisor to um, uh, one of the states in Nigeria who sent 200 students to Alabama to be educated at historically black institutions. He sent 100 to one institution, 100 to another. He began to get complaints about one of the schools, so he visited the school and wanted to talk to someone on the campus. When he got there, he was not met by the president. He was not met by the vice president. He was not met by the dean. He was not met by the head of international students. He was met by whoever was in the office when he got there. He took 100 and moved him up the street from that campus to Alabama, the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He said, if that's the best I can get, then I will take the students to where they're going to get the kind of support that I need. Uh, when I've asked him about additional students, he's now set up a program whereby he's going to send another 200 students. We're waiting for the funding of that program. And I said, uh, let me help you decide where to send the students. He said, give me the list of the 10 best HBCUs you've got in the country. I said, excuse me. He said, I'm not just sending them to just any institution. He said, this is my list. Engineering, computer sciences, uh, business. I want your best schools. I'm in the market. I'm paying for it. I want the very best. Now, this leads someone in my position to a tricky spot, okay? Uh, and it has gotten some hardballs thrown at me. But my reckoning on this is, if we're going to build relationships with our brethren in the other countries, our initial programs ought to be successful. 
how to put those students where they're going to get most of the support that they need. And when I talk to people at campuses, if they think bringing these students to their campus is just a cash flow issue, you throw them in a dorm and forget them, then that's not where I'm going to make the recommendations. Internationalization of your campus requires a much deeper commitment. The test, the test, is that if there's an emergency and I cannot get the president of that school to return a phone call, that's not the school where we want to send the students. And don't tell me that if you've got Muslim students on your campus, they're just going to have to learn to eat what you serve for breakfast. <laughs> if they're paying the same as everybody else, they deserve choices other than bacon, ham, and whatever else you've got in the dormitory. And if they have spatial cultural sensitivities, then we ought to have a conversation about that and some support for them. If they have religious requests, there ought to be a quiet place to pray whoever you pray to. And if you're not prepared to make commitments to that level, then students ought not be sent to your campus. It is that simple. Now, let me just, I can't come here and let my friends here get off. Easy. Um, my friend Dr. Ruto and I have had some conversations. I have been standing at the Brazilian Embassy uh, talking to Brazilian students, and Brazilian students are sending, uh, sending emails to all their friends in Brazil. You do not want to go to Howard. Howard does not like white people, and Howard does not like Brazilian students. Andy? I mean, uh, <laughs> not Andy. Tony? What, what's this I hear about people demonstrating? under the tree outside of Douglas Hall about getting the Brazilian students off my campus. Well, there was a big misunderstanding. And if it were not for the fact that some students had an excellent experience on this campus and insisted and recommended this campus to their friends when they got back to Brazil, you would not have any Brazilian students on this campus because they talked to each other. Um, you will find around this country pools of students from various countries on various campuses. And the reason is because the students who've been there have a good experience. And they are the most powerful diplomats for your country. If they're not having a good experience in the day of Twitter and whatever else people use in Facebook, and what, well, I still use Facebook, they don't, but whatever they have migrated to, they are communicating to each other internationally, and whatever you tell me about your program, I guarantee you it's not as important as what they're telling each other. I want to talk to you about one or two other experiences because it is not as simple as one might think. Um, there's some st a student was robbed uh, at Jackson State, um, and he got on the phone and wrote to his father and said, I'm your only child and you did not send me to the United States to die on a black campus, so you better get me out of here. It just so happened that he had a powerful political father back in Brazil. I called the president of that institution. We did not have a good conversation. As a result, Brazil backed the bus up to Jackson State, put all of those kids on a bus, and drove them to Savannah and put them in another school. Now, the problem with that is that what you find in Brazil in the, and the uh, communications and in the media is don't go to black schools, they're dangerous. They don't distinguish between Jackson State and Howard and Morgan. It is, I went to a black school and it did not work out for me, and unless there's some active engagement around that issue, uh, we will have a problem. Let me try to wrap up. There, believe it or not, there is some good news. There are projects that are going on at HBCUs that one might not know about, and I thought I wanted to mention them to you because they are examples of how uh, things can and should be done. One example I would like to point out to you is something that's called a Brazil Initiative. Brazil has 90 million people of African descent. That's three times as many as you have in this country. Brazil has more people of African descent than any country other than Nigeria. But that's something that a lot of African Americans have not figured out. And they do not speak Spanish in Brazil. They speak Portuguese. As they do in Mozambique. Okay, yeah, and as they do in Angola. Um, but that population has shown a real interest in HBCUs and what they know 
And the question that they have posed is, can they contribute something to the way Brazilians are trying to figure out their way to greater power in that country? So, the president of Brazil has executed an agreement with an alliance of HBCUs, Howard is one of them, to send Brazilian students to the United States to study, but to include within that group HBCUs. When we took a look at what Brazil wanted, 70% of the students were either in engineering or computer science. Second, most of the students that they sent to us did not speak English. They spoke Portuguese. And so the question was, do, does your school have a support system so that I can send a speaker of Portuguese and then we'll find the support on your campus? What this boiled down to is if you had a school of engineering and English as a second language, you had a sweet spot. And so it turned out the six schools ended up with 80% of those students. They thought I was favoring Howard and Morgan and Southern and Tennessee State and uh, A&T. But the fact of the matter was that they had what the Brazilians were asking for. That is going to be true as you engage Africa. I'm going to tell you about an exciting meeting I had with um, an ambassador about 10 days ago, the ambassador to Gabon. I had with him the ambassador from the Congo. And I wanted to know why he was spending $35 million to send Gabonese students to the University of Oregon. And he said, because they came to talk to me and made an offer, and it seemed like a reasonable offer. I asked him if he'd ever heard of Howard, if he'd ever heard of UDC. He said he'd heard about him recently. He tried to make contact with Howard, but had not been successful. I'm telling you what the man told me. Okay. Um, but he was interested. He was very interested in relationship to HBCUs, and not just him, but he thought his colleagues were. We just had not approached the conversation. So what he, is in, what he has agreed to do is pull together the ambassadors from all of the Central African countries, Mozambique, Angola, Chad, all of them, to sit around the table to talk about looking at the Brazilian model to put those students together. But we need somebody to mediate that conversation, and we need a group of HBCUs who are interested and who are willing to make the commitment. Again, I'm going to say, they are not going to send their students just because your skin is brown. This is an investment in the development of their country. They're going to send you engineers to train. They're going to send you people to get trained in the business community, EPA, agriculture. There are HBCUs who can provide those services. But if you're not a land-grant college, you can't have that conversation by yourself. You need to have an A&T, okay, or Tennessee State, or Prairie View in the room with you. And so this intramural competition between HBCUs will have to be mediated to some degree, and someone is going to have to agree to speak in broader terms. If, in the interest of all the HBCUs, we're going to move, uh, move this forward. Uh, the Brazilian model looks good, and we got a call from Colombia saying, we like what you're doing with Brazil. We have Afro-Colombians. We'd like to see if we can make that model work for us. So right now, in, right now, in Colombia, there's a meeting going on called the Capri Negotiations. The focus of that will be expo expanding equal opportunity, uh, equality, and training the Afro-Caribbean population, the Afro-Colombian population, and what role can HBCUs play in that conversation. HBCUs have to be able to step up and provide a plausible and productive response uh, to that. Again, um, what I've done is I've asked an Afro, and I've asked an Afro Afro Colombian woman who happens to head a, head a program down at um, at Benedict if she would step in and at least begin conversation. She is a native of Colombia. She runs a very impressive program at Benedict. She knows her way around Colombia. She has agreed to do that. Now we need to surround her with other HBCUs who can contribute to the conversation. Um, China has provided 100,000 
scholarships and fellowships for students who attend HBCUs. Their idea of a scholarship, however, is once you get to China, uh, we will provide for your resources. The issue of getting to China and whatever personal resources you need to take with you when you go is a real issue for our students, as you know. One of the real barriers for African-American students and students at HBCU is just to do the analysis again. 65% of our students are female. 65% of them need federal financial assistance to get through. And for most of them, the most important thing is to get through school as quickly as they can with a little, with a little uh, additional charges. And that's a real barrier. Not only that, many of them have never been anywhere except from that city that they grew up to that college campus. And this mama is really not into this thing about you going to Malawi, or you going to where, are you talking about in East Africa. Hey, I can't get to you when you're in Chicago. I don't know about you going this far. And what is going to be the return for you spending a half year or a year studying in this strange place? Uh, that is a conversation that we're going to have to uh, engage. Um, I will um, just recently we met with uh, the Senegalese embassy where there was a significant um, presentation on the needs for development in that country. What the HBCUs will have to consider both with the Central African issue and with Senegal is whether or not language is going to be an issue, whether or not we're going to make a commitment to teach our youngsters to speak languages and to make the adjustments on our campus that will make sure that youngsters from other countries who speak other languages will be supported. If the Central African group comes together, that's Portuguese, that's French, and that's Arabic. And so the students who come from that group will have to find places where they're comfortable. And so that's a commitment that if we are serious, we're going to have to make. It's as simple in some cases as having English as a second language, bringing folks in a semester early, making sure there's some adjustment, then introducing them to the faculty and making sure they're prepared to go into the classes. Sometimes it's going to take a year. Brazil was prepared to pay it. I will, I, I really am going to wrap up now. I just want to tell you about my uh, our, our, our experience with Brazil. Brazil was committed to this project, but then Brazil had elections. Uh, we, um, we went to the Brazilians to say, we've got this program going, we're sending students all over the United States, but we know that very few of them are Afro-Brazilian. And what we really would like, we can't, we'll take whatever money you're sending us, but we'd like for you to send some Afro-Brazilian students too. And they agreed to adjust the program. As a matter of fact, they came up with something called the Nascimento Program, which was going to fund students who self-identified themselves as either indigenous or Afro-Brazilian. And then there was an election, a very close election. The president got reelected. Oh, they put aside the money for the program. The president got reelected. Um, uh, the cabinet submitted its resignation. She accepted resignation to include the minister of education, which left the Senate file model for a minute. Then she put another sec minister of education in. And then about a month ago, the parliament threw him out. So she now has to appoint another minister of education. So we have two problems. One is that the uh, elections have implications. The same thing happened in Nigeria. As soon as we got our program together, there were elections. And in Nigeria, there's a change in leadership. I've been assured that the program will stay on, but it'll be a little while before the students come to see us. Uh, but in both the instance of Nigeria and Brazil, the exchange rate has changed significantly. So that the budget that the Brazilians put together three years ago is now 50% of its value at the time the money was set aside for the program. So now the Brazilians and the Nigerians visit and they want to know if we can give them concessions. And I say, brother, I really would like to give you concessions, but if any good group of institutions in the country cannot afford concessions at this point, this HBCU, we really would like to find a way to make this work. It's a problem. It's not the end of a program, but it's the reality of the way the world works. And having lived and worked without much for as long as these institutions have been around, all I'm asking for is some creativity and some commitment. You are involved in a program with the Harriet Tubman, um, the Harriet Tubman University. Um, 
Barbara Simmons is sitting in the back, who is um, the dean from Harriet Tubman, uh, who's involved in a program here that has your school of architecture involved, along with Tuskegee and Morgan State University, very innovative program, putting together a library, beginning to look at roads and library at this point. Looks like it could make a significant contribution. Uh, Lincoln University is teaching um, online courses and they are teaching online courses to Benin. Um, I had a conversation with a representative of the South Sudan uh, a week ago visiting Benedict College. She's very interested in knowing what kinds of relationships can be put together. I have gone on and on, but at this point I'm going to wrap up by saying the opportunities are there. They are not simple opportunities, but what they are going to require, in my opinion, is a group of HBCUs that are interested in participating in the development of the continent doing, taking a two-step process. One, coming together to figure out what their resources are and what their areas of interest are and where they can support each other and in a consortial basis. The second thing you're going to have to do is ask the African countries what they want rather than try to sell them what Americans want to sell. When, when Ms. Simmons uh, had a conversation with uh, the Senegalese recently, the question was, are you interested in our working within the framework of the French higher education system, or are you want to move toward, more toward the American system? The Senegalese made a very common sense response. They said, we're not interested in either one. What we're interested in is the Senegalese system built on our culture and our future and our needs. We're not trying to do what Americans do. We're not trying to do what the French have done. We want to move forward. And so with that degree of humility, if Americans are prepared to interact with Africa and her children on the basis of figuring out what's in their interest, I think we'll find out it is also in our interest. I'd like to wrap up by saying when I was last in South Africa. Our relationship to Africa is long and many people may not be uh, familiar with the kinds of relationships that we've had with Africa, but um, I taught black politics here and it was clear to me that W.B. Du Bois died in Ghana and that that was relevant. As a graduate and a professor from Fisk, George Padmore from Fisk and Howard, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who had gone to Lincoln, uh, Ezekiel Way, first president of, uh, of Nigeria, had come out of an HBCU. And if you stride through the Caribbeans, all of the parliaments, you'll hear Howard, you'll hear Fisk, you'll hear Spelman, um, all over the place. Um, and I was asking a little earlier about Stokely Carmichael, who died as yeah, uh, Mr. Toure died in Africa uh, because that's where he felt comfortable. And in my last visit to uh, the home of Nelson Mandela, I saw on the wall a picture, a frame of a letter from the president of Central State encouraging him while he had been in prison. So our relationships at the institution is long and uh, strong, and I hope we can continue to keep them that way. Thank you all for spending so much time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Condensed information, knowledge, and knowledge you get, I tell them, in our one month back, you do the equivalent of that in one hour. So we will open the floor for comments, questions, and uh, continue the engagement. I'll say, first of all, thank you, Dr. Hollis, for your uh, sharing with us the very uh, helpful information about the background and the trends and the direction. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, raising a question from the perspective of work with that African American faith communities across the globe. And part of the uh, question I was going to raise is given the uh, engagement of HBCUs 
sharing that today one of the things that they're faced and challenged with is the economic survival of the, of the institution itself as a priority part, which you alluded to earlier in terms of the last thing that the need is the devaluation. How do you see uh, uh, the opportunity for HBCUs to strengthen, one, their capacity for the survival uh, in the economic set settings that we're operating in now, and in the context of the global portion of that engagement with the countries that you speak of, having the uh, posture of being able to say that the students you send here will be at an institution that will continue to be able to uh, grow and be strong. Uh, what are the kind of factors that we need to be looking at and thinking about uh, from your perspective of watching how things are developing in the, in the world uh, that you would suggest that both the HBCUs themselves need to be doing as you already uh, given some things in terms of decisions that need to be made but also the economic environments we're in and what are the partnerships uh, in our communities that HBCUs can uh, engage to help in, in being in that posture looking at the future years? I'd like to make two points. One is, it is not just in the interest of HBCUs to be involved in the places where the world is growing. It is in this country's interest. And in some ways, you have advantages in certain parts of the world. We're assuming until you open your mouth, at least you have an advantage. Um, if you show some cultural sensitivity, uh, you, the con conversation may continue. But we have at least six agencies, State Department, Defense Department, um, the Foreign Agricultural Service, Peace Corps, uh, the Department of Education. Um, I've left one out. Um, but all of the uh, Commerce Department, all of whom have an interest, all of whom have an interest in having us successfully reach out into these other markets and who have programs that can do that. Two things are an issue. One, they generally don't think of HBCUs as vehicles for doing that. They're looking to the University of Iowa to take them to Haiti or the University of Minnesota to take them to Kenya. Um, I do believe that you can be effective political actors if you go as a group to say we're interested in being in Haiti, we're interested in being in Kenya, we're interested in being in Nigeria. Not only that, we've talked to the Nigerians and they're interested in having us. That's, that's one, uh, so you can go together, that's one step. The second thing is in terms of support for this activity, in reality, it's the poor wanting to help the poor, and you have to try to figure out where you find resources to support it. Our strategy has to be not only depending on a government, but also you should look to the religious community because the religious community has resources that can be brought to bear. In the conversation in Angola, it was a minister from a church from Angola who said, we thought you weren't interested in our youngsters because they don't speak English, but I'm going to go back to the Angolan government and we're going to talk to them about a relationship to HBCUs because if you can teach kids from Brazil, you can teach kids from Angola. I can tell you, as a result of that inquiry, Angola has already now asked for a delegation to come uh, of HBCUs to talk to them. Um, so the religious community has some resources. The third part is you must, you should think of this in terms of who has an economic interest in seeing your participation. There are private entities who would, who if they think about it, should, should, should see themselves lining up with you, hiring your interns, and brokering movement back and forth between here and the markets where they have some interest. IBM is trying to get in here. This agricultural company is trying to get in here. If you and the government of that country come to say, we need to train people to be part of the economy here and to run that drawing economy, it's in your interest and our interest, I think you'll find that the private sector is willing to listen to that. And your plan ought to be maybe to start with the government, but your overall plan ought to be to move your resources from the government over time into the private sector and into the nonprofit sector. Hope I answered your question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Hollis. Um, my question has to do with the, you know, your last point. Um, William B. S. Tubman, uh, in fact, we just had a Skype meeting yesterday between um, our uh, College of Engineering and the College of Engineering at 
Morgan State University. Um, because on Friday, the World Bank it has approached us about doing a, a joint project. So the government piece is important, but how do we um, garner the support of the private sector? Because um, the sectors have worked separately in the past, and, and we know going forward we need to operate differently. I have yet to see the director of international students, with one exception, bring the dean of the school of business along with them when they have the conversation. When that person ought to be part of the conversation. They've been very smart at Southern. Wherever that director goes and there's an interest in developing a commercial and a business class, she takes the dean of engineering and the dean of the school of business so that he's looking at what he ought to be teaching youngsters and he's trying to convince them, send them to my school of business. We want to understand your economy and we want to help train the future movements in your economy. So you've got a dean of the school of business. Uh, that person ought to be part of the conversation and you should approach your graduates of your institutions who are prominent in the business world and who think like businessmen and will tell you, I can buy this piece of it, I can't buy that piece of it. Uh, but if you can give me such and such benefit, I'll spend my money and I will support you. So you got to go to your alumni and you got to go to that school of business and help them. They'll look at it and say, this doesn't make sense from a business perspective. But if you add this, uh, we could probably get some traction. So those would be my recommendations. Thank you very much for uh, for the numbers that you presented in your study, which kind of made me very excited about the recent study I did on international migration of women from Africa to the United States. And my question is this. I believe that the goal of this collaboration between the HBCUs and the, and the African continent is towards development of the continent. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, plans in place to ensure that these students that come to the United States actually go back to Africa to help towards that development process? Because what happens is that after their education, many of them tend to stay back. Um, you may note that I'm, I spoke to the fact that there's been a huge movement of Africans with degrees to the United States because they're moving, seeking those opportunities. I do not know that you can stop that, but the Brazilians were very smart about their approach. The Brazilians will send you to study for your second and third year, but you have to come back to Brazil to graduate for the fourth year. And if they pay if they pay for those two years, you have to commit yourself to four years of service in Brazil uh, as a way of paying off for the education. So there are ways to address this issue. And interestingly enough, um, some uh, folks who are now graduating from institutions, when they go back and they have to put in that three or four years, they're finding opportunities that they would not have imagined and are staying to take advantage of those opportunities. But I think a government to the degree that it's a government program, they have legitimate interest in, com in requiring those students to come back and spend some time in service to the country if the country pays for their education. I think we're winding down up two more. Uh, as we read the, uh, the description of uh, things that your, uh, your office does, uh, one of them is that you try to facilitate uh, knowledge of federal grants and programs uh, that uh, we could tap into on international affairs. Uh, would there be somebody uh, in your office or uh, would there be something that you all had published that would help us identify grants uh, that we could uh, tap into? Well, we have compiled information about federal programs and their functions across the agencies that I've talked about. I will be retiring in June. Uh, in the meantime, however, there's a fellow named Terrence Tarver, um, who is an intern 
in our office who claims to have some interest in international programs. Uh, so uh, I do expect that over the next, when I explained to the director last week, I sent him a note giving a date for retirement. My computer blew up the other day. We had to talk. Um, and I think what that's about is how we transfer, how we put that information together so that people can continue to access it after I leave. The difficulty, however, is that within these agencies, I find that the relationships are personal. Uh, you have to know folks. You have to go back and see them two or three times. I tell people that if you think you go and submit a grant and you get you get an award, that's not the way it works. You submit a grant and they tell you what's wrong with it the first year. And then you submit a second one and they say much better. And then you hope that person doesn't get promoted and moved on before you submit it a third time. But if you get, after that two years of conversation, I would expect that you're good enough friends. You know how where, the, where each other's kids are in school, and, and and by the third year, you ought to be able to put something together. So um, what we will do in our office is I'm I'm sure that our executive director, Dr. Cooper, understands the importance of this as an area where HBCUs must have a real presence. And I expect that he'll find a way to support the program. Well, we we understand that uh, Terrence is also a PhD student in our department, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you can't get to Terrence, you're in real trouble. <laughs> you're gonna be in real trouble. Why, why, why did uh, Reagan sign the... Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Um, the, we were trying to figure out, the, 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 old, the folks got around the table and said, what if Carter doesn't win? Then we got to figure out how to get Reagan to sign on to an executive order for HBCUs. So Vernon Jordan called Mary Berry and said, send Mel out to California. And I went out to California to talk to the black person who was leading Reagan around the country. His name was Clarence Pendleton, who was a former swimming coach at Howard University. And I go to talk to uh, Penny, as I call him, and I said, this is your guy. Um, my job is to make sure this interest in black colleges gets transferred to the next administration if Carter doesn't win. We both sat there because we knew Carter wasn't going to win. So I said, my job is to make sure that, uh, that we can get something done. And Penny said, well, i tell you what, um, who is the, the jazz xylophonist um, who died in New York, uh, famous for playing it? Lionel Hampton. Uh, Lionel Hampton. So Clarence says to me, Lionel Hampton is in charge of colored affairs for Reagan. You have to go talk to Lionel Hampton. We go and we talk to Lionel Hampton. I had him right down here to the place that served hot cross buns. I used to be on the water. And I said, Mr. Hampton, uh, it's very important that uh, Reagan support historically black colleges. And he looked at me and said, why? I said, well, let me explain it to you. And I explained it to him. And he said, sounds pretty good to me. He said, that, that sounds about right. He said, Hollis, what I want you to do is write up something and send it to me and I'll take it to the policy committee and we'll put it in the policy committee. So I wrote it up and sent it to him and I waited and I waited and I waited. And I called and I said, Mr. Hampton, what happened? He said, man, this sounds like a bunch of democratic stuff. It's all liberal stuff. I can't take this to Reagan. He said, write me some conservative stuff. Write me some Republican stuff. I said, okay. I went back and looked up the Republican stuff, self-independence and pull yourself up by the bootstrap and all that good stuff. I wrote that up. Then sent it to him. He called said, Hollis, this is good. This is good. This is good. Next thing I knew, I picked up Jet Magazine and Reagan had committed himself to historical black institutions. And if he got elected, he was going to support black folks. And everybody there was a big spread talking about how it led to independence and you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I said, we're on. And so once Mr. Reagan got elected, the next day I knew he'd uh, signed the executive order. Now I should just tell you that his vice president who succeeded him, uh, Daddy Bush, I'll call him, had been a member of the, of the uh, United Negro College Fund Board before he became vice president. So we didn't really didn't have to explain stuff to him. And then when Clinton came on, you know you didn't have to explain to Clinton because he's from Arkansas. And then Mr. Bush Jr. could not sign it because his father had signed it. And then when the first black president got elected, he could not sign it. It would have been a mess if that had happened. So here we are. Uh, six presidents have signed that executive order. And um, I expect a seventh president. 
um, because if black folks had not supported a certain senator in Mississippi, he would not be in his job right now. And he's made it clear that he's going to pay back what he owes. And so if we, it, it, so we'll have a strategy no matter who wins the White House to get to continue the White House mission. I just uh, want to uh, commend you for supporting the Nascimento program Thank you. in Brazil. It's a great program, uh, particularly in light of the fact that many Afro-Brazilians went on hunger strike. They actually went on hunger strike to attend HBCUs to make their voices heard uh, in Brazil. You would be surprised what conversations went on over my phone and to fry, fry what's, what's father? The guy who had Edgy Cafro. Um, no, uh, Gilberto, uh, Gilberto Gil? No, it's Fry, I'll, I'll remember his name in a minute, but do, we we had some conversations about closing offices down in Brazil to make sure that the Nascimento program was established. And I think uh, while we're on the subject, um, uh, while we're on the subject, um, <laughs> the president of Brazil will be visiting in October and November. And within the next 36 hours, I will have conversations with certain persons to make sure that the issue of black colleges stays on her agenda and she brings it with her when she comes to the United States. One more. Yes, uh, I'm a student from uh, the Department of Economics. I'm from Gabon. I'm in uh -huh. a PhD program. That's why I come here because I know you should talk about Gabon. But I, I really want to know what should be. Like if you want to make more relationships with my country, like this can be like uh, what you expect or what what should be your commitment? I really want to know because you already talked to the embassy, and uh, I, I don't I don't know what you you talk about. You know. uh, let me, let me just take the conversation. First of all, I must say I am impressed by your ambassador. He comes out of the private sector and he doesn't give a whole bunch of government gobbledygook. He says, okay, this is what we need to do. Let's figure out a time frame to do it. I asked him why he was spending $35 million in Oregon. He said, well, Lord, you know, they came to talk to us. And I said, well, if you will take a look at this, I believe on behalf of HBCUs, I can say that we will, we can probably come in at about two thirds of what you're spending in Oregon. We have 15 schools of engineering. We've got three medical schools. We've got schools of pharmacy. We've got schools of nursing. We've got and now all of this is important. Plus, I believe that I can talk our leadership into what I call more culturally appropriate delivery of of these services, and I can make the argument that for most Africans, our institutions are located in communities where they're going to find more sort of support, social support, religious support in other areas. And that's a strong argument for success of your students. And so why don't we talk about what your needs are? So what he said he's going to do is he's going to go back and he's going to sit with the seven or eight countries and make up this group. And they're going to come up with a list of where their priorities are. And they're going to come back, and HBCUs will be able to meet some of those priorities, but not all of them. I'm not going to argue that all of the students ought to go to HBCUs if they have needs that cannot be adequately served. But given the number of students that they'll be talking about, it will be a significant addition to the population of the HBCUs. And it is not just for the benefit of the students who are coming, it's for the benefit of the students who are here. Uh, there's a whole world view that they need to be exposed to and understand that the world didn't begin when the first slave ship landed in the United States and only 5% of those folks came here anyway. If you don't believe it, ask the Brazilians. Um, and you can be both black and Hispanic or black and speak French and all these other stuff. Folks need to hear that for the benefit of the students who are here. So I do believe that given that, that there's a very business-like attitude by your ambassador, and we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about business, we're talking about uh, specific needs in engineering, I think we can match them up with specific institutions that have very good programs in those areas. And uh, we won't get all of the students, but I think we'll get a good number.
I think we're coming to a close before I ask uh, Dr. Minister to close formally. I want to express my appreciation for the time it's taken to share this with us and with your insights. Like I said, it's too bad this place wasn't much bigger, but hopefully we'll bring him back. And thankfully this will be, it's being recorded, we'll put it up on YouTube where the audience in Africa, Brazil and the world would listen to the message. If so, I had known that, I would dress differently. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thanks, but I want uh, Dr. Winston to screw it for me.